Who are you? My name's Abby. My background's actually in law. How did that transition go down? I have put quite a lot of work into sort of my pole dancing. Nothing against the girls that are doing it. It's just not for me. What the hell? Yeah, I guess just kind of give us some backstory before before OnlyFans was a thing. Okay, so my name's Abby. My stage name is also Lola, so I sort of go by two different aliases. My background is actually in law, which was a bit interesting because my life took like a whole sort of U turn. Um, started off pole dancing when I was in university, just in sort of stress relief, and then went into that side of things. Did that for a couple of years and um, I actually started doing a PhD and it was only when I was about two years into my PhD that I realised that I actually hated it. <laughs> so I was like, I don't want to do this for the rest of my life, like the way that the universities treat you as a person. Like, it's not so much the research and the teaching that was the issue. I think it was more why employers can treat you when you're in that sort of environment. Um, started trying... A bit more bits and bobs on social media, which has been the challenge. And then there was a few sort of bumps on the road with that, which I'm thought I'm sure we'll discuss. And then I found Scotty's course. <laughs> uh, yeah, it seems like maybe not for all people, obviously, but at least for me, if I imagine myself pursuing like, you know, being a lawyer or a doctor or something like that, to me, that just seems like such a miserable career that you just become a prisoner of that career is that is that what you felt like when you were going down that road yeah so for me I think going into, P into the PhD route for law I was very much like I wanted to go into human rights activism this that and the other because I'm quite opinionated um I like my own research and everything and I couldn't imagine being if you're a solicitor or a lawyer you're essentially just being told what to do and you're writing it down on a piece of paper and that's it whereas for me I'm very questioning I question everything which is not what they want <laughs> they just want someone that's just going to apply it so I was like, I'll go down the academia route. Um, but in the UK, it's so massively underpaid. Like, you can't get a sort of a permanent contract. Like, they're t treating you really badly. And I'd only really have started making a decent income probably into my sort of late 40s. Um, and even then, it's not sort of secure. And I was just thinking, for how much time and effort I've put into getting this law degree and a master's, the reward at the end of it isn't that great like there was actually um an oxford professor so i don't know if you've heard of the university of oxford you probably have probably have it's mm -hmm. quite a prestigious university yeah. there was a lady that was lecturing english there so she had a phd doctorate so very intelligent woman and she was living in a tent because she couldn't afford rent jeez and i think because of the way that i am as a person because i'm quite creative I found like I was struggling to balance those two sides. So I have like the academic side and then this creative side that likes to dress up as a unicorn <laughs> spinning around the world. And <laughs> okay, so just to make sure I, I understand kind of how this went down. So you were kind of pursuing that and then mm -hmm. you're doing pole dancing kind of just as a hobby or something like that. And then at some point you started doing that at clubs or like yeah. how did that transition go down? Um, so my pole, first time pole teacher, she came from, I've got to get this right now, Los Angeles, and she now lives in the UK. And um, she was teaching me and she was like, have you thought about going and working in the club while you're doing your degree? Because it'd be a way of funding it where you only have to work, like, in essence, one or two days a week to make roughly a week's income that you'd make doing like a nine to five. So I was like, I'll give it a go. I rocked it to this audition at the age of like 21. I had no idea what I was doing. Bear in mind, they call it an audition, but anyone can get, get in because you pay then extortionate amounts of money to be there mm -hmm. so you're paying like hundreds of pounds to be there in the club so you start off in a minus and then obviously you're paid through tips which they then take commission from so i refer to it as a bit of a gambling job but whereas with online it's kind of like if you don't make money that day you're in your pajamas whereas when you've like driven all that way to a club like you spent all the money on your outfit you work until six o'clock in the morning. But that's how I got started doing it. Um, mostly because I love dancing, but that job isn't really about dancing. It's more, you're like a sales, you're a salesperson and uh, you yeah. just have to basically talk and pander to people coming in, like laugh at their jokes, even though they're not very funny. And <laughs> like, yeah, I would not be good at that. 
Yeah, that se- I mean, that seems like a tough grind. So do you work or do you live like, uh, or were you dancing, I guess, in a big city or is it more like a smaller community? So it uh, depends on you. For me personally, I used to drive sort of like half an hour away because their setup was slightly better. So it's a very unregulated industry. So in different clubs, they will charge you different amounts to work and then they take different rates of commission. So like one club B could be 20% of everything that you make. But the club that I went to, it was in sort of like a smallish city. Um, and they let you keep all of your cash tips and then they took 20% on your uh, card earnings, but you'd have to spend like £70 to work. But I think it's just changed. Like it's a bit of a dying industry in the UK, I think, because we're trying to emulate America, <laughs> you guys. And we don't have a tipping culture here. So people don't tip, <laughs> which was which sucked because I thought me being a dancer and creative, I was like, yeah, I'm just going to get on the pole. It's going to be amazing. We'll get all this money thrown at me, and I'm just going to be able to do tricks. <laughs> and then I was like, "Oh, I actually have to talk to these people." Yeah, that's that. That I is a trip because I didn't that. realize. Yeah, I didn't think. I mean, I know that you know the United States, everything's kind of based on tipping, and it's not like that at other places. But I figured that was just kind of like a universal understanding at a club like that. Like you just like <laughs> that's what. Wow, it is. that's very interesting. I have put quite a lot of work into sort of my pole dancing and everything. And I think it's something that should be compensated properly well that was my thought like what's the incentive for you to like get up and go there yeah exactly and um i think it's just because the way i think people seem to think that the clients are the exploitative ones but it's not it's the management and our legislation that are because the management get away with it so they'll tell you that you're self-employed essentially. But a lot of the obligations that they put on you, they treat you like an employee, which is a big um, legal issue in the UK at the moment. So a lot of people like lobbying for change and everything, saying that there should be really an hourly rate for dancers to go into the club, essentially. Yeah. There should be like a minimum wage. Yeah, it makes sense because, I mean, yeah, if, if, if the dancers aren't incentivized to go then i could see how it would become a dying industry and the clubs would eventually be forced to kind of just close it down i guess well the the way that they're surviving is because there's not so many customers going in they're just ramping the house fees up so the house fee is um something that you pay as you walk in the door to work so what they do is they say okay well we'll just get 10 more dancers on and make them pay up like 100 pounds each to work and if you think then before any customers have walked through the door they're already in a profit. Huh, yeah, that's that's a trip. Yeah, it's it's pretty bad. And I think because of when I was working there, I, it just got to the point where I was getting really angry with it because, because I'm having studied law as well. Like I can remember my manager was like saying this and that to me. I was like, well, you can't actually treat me like that because I'm not an employee. Like he asked for um, a sick note from me, which I was like, you can't, ha- you can't have a sick note from me because I don't get statutory sick pay from you <laughs> like and mm. um, so yeah this... i would yeah i would be like fuck off are you fucking <laughs> shitting me <laughs> what the hell um so but unfortunately it's just a regular i don't know if it will ever change but in their eyes they're profiting so they're not going to change the model to make it better for the dancers there's a few unions and everything in the in the uk but it's not good <laughs> like <laughs> so what did your um because you're you know pursuing this kind of like normal career path and then you ventured off in this other direction what did your friends and family how did they respond to that um I'm quite lucky I suppose in that way that I do live in this bubble because everyone lives these sort of like alternative lifestyles like they're even like pole dance teachers or like burlesque performers or existing nice yeah so we're kind of like in this like sheltered little bubble when we see everything else going on we're like god that's weird (laughs) for my family they don't always necessarily understand it so they've always been supportive might not necessarily understand what i do but um i think even from the age of 21 like when i was sort of spinning around a pole like buying these massive like eight inch shoes they were like well don't really get it but like it seems to be making you making you happy and like you're not um like out doing whatever you just sort of sat in the pole studio so (laughs) well that's nice that they're not against it that's kind of like how our parents are too they're like we don't really get what you're doing but seems like you're doing well with it so (laughs) it's fine yeah 
I think it's a genera- it's a generational thing, isn't it, with social media and stuff. Um, anything social media related, really. Like, I still don't think it's treated as work. So, you know, yeah. it's, it's not like a, it's not seen as a normal job, whatever that is. Um, I reckon yeah. that will change, though. I think it's still quite early in its infancy, really, with um, work on social media in general. Yeah, even on, like, because um, I'm always kind of just, like, experimenting with things. And I've created, you know, Instagram uh, Instagram accounts and TikTok accounts, like, when we first started that were kind of like my YouTube channel, right? Kind of just, like, talks about OnlyFans, blah, blah, whatever. And those accounts got banned right away. But now I have similar accounts like that, like for this podcast and stuff like that, where it's kind of, it's you know, it's not the standard OnlyFans marketing type of stuff, but it talks about OnlyFans, whatever. Mm-hmm. And now those accounts seem to be fine. So I feel like even, you know, those platforms like TikTok and Instagram are starting to realize or, you know, kind of understand that it's a bit more mainstream now. Well, which... and I feel as long as the creator is, respecting the platform you know it should be allowed what is the difference well okay so you've been in the group for a pretty long time now right like a year or something like that i remember when you rebranded to your actual name and stuff like that um things started to kind of turn around a little bit so tell us kind of how that all played out um so it's something that i was very resistant to resistant towards doing because my niche at the time is pole because that's what I enjoy doing but unfortunately um because I've been on social media for a while when you do pole dancing because it's seen as adult it will just basically land you in a fat shadow band like you cannot be seen like even um if you're not wearing heels Instagram and TikTok just does not like it. Anything with a pole in like it's very rare that you'll see it on the explore page etc etc so it's when you did um your review on my account where I was like okay it was basically like starting from scratch which I think is why it took me longer because I had to get rid of this sort of the shadow ban and basically decide who I was going to be so I was trying a few different things not everything was sticking like I had a few viral videos on TikTok which was fantastic but then obviously the issue is with virality is that it only lasts maybe a week so while that video is is going viral it's then dead then and then it sort of dried up for a little bit and I thought, okay, I'm just going to start doing a bit more to do my personality. So I started doing TikTok lives because I saw people talking about it in the group. I still didn't see much success. I, I find it amazing actually how I managed to grind all of this out because I was like, it's like beating, <laughs> like beating a dead horse. <laughs> so I just sat on these TikTok lives and then I think because I was getting a little bit frustrated, I started responding to trolls because I'm quite sarcastic and I think because it's the British accent as well suddenly people were really enjoying it <laughs> so, mm-hmm. so rather than me having to do the forced smile thing which I think a lot of women are very accustomed to doing I was like what will happen if I take this dramatically in the opposite direction and ever since then it's really took off for me <laughs> like which has been amazing so it's, it's weird how my niche has accidentally evolved was that idea kind of born from your TikTok then? The TikTok yeah, lives? So I think it was just because I was doing my TikTok lives. Um, and then because of the way that I talk to people, because I'm quite sarcastic and sharp, I realised that there's like, quite a few comments coming in where I was like, oh, that's a bit of a weird thing to say. So I started researching it. I actually booked an um, audit call with a professional um, dog. <laughs> <laughs> looked Ooh, over nice. all of my... Um, social medias etc and she gave me some advice on what I should do because even within the dom world there's different sort of niches and that sort of thing I don't really know why I didn't do it sooner because it's actually more fitting with my personality maybe it's all the pent-up rage that I've had from pandering to men in clubs and I was like ah now I get to be the one that hands out the abuse (laughs) Well, it seems like a perfect progression. That's cool. Yeah, certainly. It's a lot more natural to my personality as well, which I think is maybe comes across more so in the content that I'm creating. It's more authentic. So, you know, I'm not having to think, okay, I'm going to put this outfit on. Like, I can just take a video in, like, my gym wear, like, my Converse, etc. So, like, how I appear in sort of normal day-to-day life um, and do it that way. And ever since then, it's, yeah, it's been probably the best thing that I've, I've done and I enjoy it as well, so... That's awesome. And there's a handful of creators that do really, really well with basically a similar strategy that you're using where they're basically just 
you know, they're not dressing up. They're not put, you know, doing all this stuff. They just get on, make little video responses to comments, and they just crank out a ton of content. So from a, a sheer volume point of point of view, that's a great strategy. It allows you to make a ton of content really quickly, very easily. So I think that's a great strategy. But you're also doing like pretty good with TikTok Live, right? Yeah. So yeah, tell us about that. So TikTok Live, I don't know if you know much about how TikTok Live operates, um, but people can send through gifts. So these can be from sort of like roses, which are like a, a penny. So I think it'd probably be less than a cent. The reality is you don't actually do anything. You just sort of sit there and um, you show your personality through and you're building up your own community, which I realised is separate to almost your TikTok following. So the people that follow you off the basis of, say, a video that's gone viral, they might be following you because of they like what they see in that video. Whereas people that are scrolling through TikTok Live, it's almost like a separate audience. As I started sort of chatting away more, I realised that there was people coming in that are still within sort of the niche of sort of um, being a dom that were sending my sending me TikTok gifts through. So they weren't necessarily interested in being part of like the RF community or whatever, what have you. They just come on my TikTok Live to have a chat and then they show support to creators by sending these gifts through. And so, but I'm not like particularly massive on TikTok yet with that. It's building up, but there's people that make like crazy, crazy money doing TikTok live. Well, have you seen the the sleepers, the the sleeping accounts where they basically just go live sleeping and they just make a ton of money? I couldn't sleep if I knew people were looking at me. It's the same as um the really popular one is ASMR. Like for ASMR lives, like they have like about five thousand people watching that, and then what they do, it's so clever actually. Um, because they will mark up what gifts to send and they'll correlate with the sound to make an ASMR. So there's a girl that, like, if you send her a cat paw, cat purr, she'll purr into the microphone. Oh, interesting. And it's insane, but it's amazing how much hate the people get on there, though, because you'll see people in the comments saying, this is stupid, like, it's terrible. Why, why are you sat here doing this? And I'm like, well... <laughs> It probably put, it probably helps when you start getting a bunch of haters and yeah, it yeah. boosts it boosts you essentially. That's cool. I had, I had even on my list right here with my questions. Um, one of the questions on there is like, how do you deal with haters? Like, you know, obviously every OnlyFans creator is going to get a ton of hate from you know Christian conservatives, red pill, oh. all that crowd. Do you get a lot of those uh, people on your stuff? I do. I, I'm quite quick to block. So sometimes what I do is I'll keep them around for maybe a couple of minutes, especially if it's on TikTok Live, because I'm like, this is kind of funny, like there's a bit of back and forth, and then there'll be people watching in, because it's like watching... People love drama, don't they? So if you can get sort of like a bit of a controversy going off in the comments or whatever... Um, people will actually sit and watch you. By the way, if you want to join us in the OnlyFans Level Up community, that is where I share all of my best secrets and strategies for OnlyFans creators, many of which are hitting really big numbers, as you may have seen from various guests on this podcast. But either way, it's a great place to be if you want to network or learn all of the best secrets and strategies to grow your OnlyFans account. You can find all of that information with the link down in the description below. But for now, back to the podcast. You, you kind of got all these different little things going on. So I'm curious, like from in terms of the proportions, right? You're making money from OnlyFans, you're making money from TikTok Live, you're making money from uh, dancing at the club, all these different things. I guess, first of all, what are, uh, is that all of the different streams of income that you have? Or is there more, do you have like different other little streams of income and stuff too? Um, so I've retired now, retired from working in the, um, in the club. So I finished that oh, last nice. year. So I was like, I don't need to do this um anymore so it's orf tiktok live i've just started an lf which is loyal fans which is very good apparently for my niche um so that's mm -hmm. like a smaller bit of income and then obviously i've got my pole teaching so it's quite a well-rounded view on the way that i'm now looking at social media which i think before and I think other creators will probably agree with me on this they get hell bent on that little of percentage that that one must be I need to be 1%, I need to be like the 0%. I'm like, well, actually, if you take into account like earnings from sort of TikTok Live and then all your other platforms as well, if you're making near enough the same amount, why does that percentage number matter? And like, say if God forbid OF ever did 
go, at least then you've got a foot in the door on multiple other platforms as well. And I tend to just cross post as well. So it's not extra work for me. So my LF will just be my RF content repurposed and put on there. Um, and obviously I've got my TikTok that's sort of running independently and everything as a traffic funnel as well and as its own sort of separate source of income. So when we f- kind of first started, we we actually tested loyal fans. That was actually one of the main reasons that we ended. <laughs> well, not the main reason, but one of the reasons that you're like, I I need to get back on OnlyFans. This is all do- this is all <laughs> this is all financial. Do- yeah, I, need to get- I didn't fit in on loyal fans because I, especially when I first started, I was really vanilla. I was co- kind of finding my feet, you know, mm-hmm. and I I don't personally come in with like kink niche like I don't really have one and so I was on there and I was just like this little vanilla like lady oh this is it this is it my space well and as far as the platform itself is con is concerned loyal fans I mean like most of the alternatives is much better than only fans in terms of you know features and just all the different, just the way that they have the site set up and configured. So in terms of the actual site itself, it I mean, like, yeah, we really like, liked loyal fans. Yeah, it was it was actually one of my favorite alternatives in terms of the actual site itself. So, but I mean, yeah, with your niche, that's just that's just a perfect fit for you, I think. Okay, so um, you know, we were kind of talking about a little bit earlier how you came into the group. It was kind of a long, slow grind for a while. And a lot, you know, some of the girls that come on the podcast, they come in and they have, they start having success relatively quickly. Others, it takes a really long time, but for, in your experience, like, what do you think, is it, you know, time management? Is it, the, is it, what is the kind of like the hardest factor or the hardest thing about OnlyFans in general? In terms of the marketing or the actual work on the platform or all of it? Yeah, I would say just, you know, out of all the various components, whether it's the marketing side or kind of the back end, you know, talking to fans, doing this, what would you say is kind of the biggest um, or the, you know, the biggest obstacle that makes the whole thing difficult for you? I would say for me, it's probably like imposter syndrome and dropping the pursuit of perfection. So I know I'm not the only one that does this, but the days where I used to film, like say, a TikTok over and over, to get it just right to the point that you're spending like 20 minutes trying to create one TikTok and then uploading it. I think that's probably the biggest obstacle and learning to let go of that because with the way that social media is going now, and this is irrespective of OF, it's rewarding authenticity. So the more authentic that you can be, like if you can get comfortable with talking to, to stories on Instagram stories and actually showcasing who you are as a person without all of all of the the frills and sort of like the cute little outfits and this, that and you that that is actually what people are going towards. So I'm massively into the fitness community as well. I love my fitness and that's the same path. If you look at fitness influencers from five years ago, it was very not relatable. So and now what we're seeing is that people want to follow people that give sort of relatable advice and they're just like normal people but to get to that point you have to be comfortable with being vulnerable and letting that putting that on social media for the world to see I think that's the the hardest thing because it is a vulnerable thing to sort of let people in past the facade of just sort of dancing around doing a cute dance and everything on who you actually are like the roots of who you are Right. Yeah, that was that was hard for me too. Yeah. We were just filming an episode yesterday with with just Sierra and I, and, and we were kind of talking about that a little bit. About I think one of the biggest things that leads creators to burnout is when they kind of build an audience around the character that they portray, and then it just becomes a super grind to wake up every day and basically just you know miserably try to continue playing this character because they think that's what people want to see they think you know that's what gets views many times the opposite is true but it's a lot more uncomfortable you know to be like you said to to be vulnerable and kind of be your actual self and display your so well i guess you know with with your tiktok lives is there any sort of tactical strategy into like like some creators that do their lives they'll have like you know their only fans username like kind of 
hiding in the background and stuff like that. Do you, do you use any little tactics like that or are you just kind of hanging out and then just whoever shows up, shows up? I used to pin it um, and then I stopped doing that because I know that AI is always always evolving to try and sort of catch people out. So I started treating my TikTok lives as more almost separate. I think that's because I saw the separate income stream that was coming from the TikTok lives. So I'm no longer just using it as a funnel. Um, and I found that People were essentially just watching me and then after a while of watching my TikTok lives, that's when they'd make the decision to sort of come through and subscribe because ultimately I don't think you need to do things where it's so in your face because if someone does like like you and they like what you have to offer, um, then they will naturally go and look at what are the things that you've got on, whether it's your Instagram, whether you've got a shop. But, like, I don't do anything, even on my... You'll see some girls on TikTok live, like, they're getting banned for sitting in, like, bikinis and, like, um, trying to basically try and get as much traffic in on the live as possible. So, like, they'll be doing, like, actions that is not appropriate for TikTok on the TikTok live. Well, and there's so much value in, like, keeping your accounts alive, you know, active and growing and, you know... I've always kind of followed that train of thought. Like, I'm so afraid to lose my accounts because starting from scratch is like a punch to the gut. There's a million ways to to do things, and some creators are super risky with their strategies. We're kind of, you know, we'll take some risks to test things here and there. Um, Like right now we're playing around with the try-on hauls on YouTube and stuff like that. Some people can get away with certain things on social media and the account stays up somehow magically. I think that's becoming less and less, though, because I do see accounts getting burned through left, right and centre. So I think it does catch up with you. In your case, I mean, the way because a lot of creators do TikTok live, but like kind of like you said, the the amount of accounts that they burn through just by trying to, you know, do sneaky little tactics and and things like that. um, Have you had trouble with your accounts getting banned on TikTok? Um, I actually got invited to TikTok headquarters, which I think is hilarious. <laughs> London. Wow. Oh, yeah. I remember you, you mentioned that in the group. Yeah. What? Uh, how does all that work? That's pretty cool. Essentially, I partnered it with an agency. So you'll have TikTok live stream agencies. They don't take anything from you, but you'll be part of a group where they give you advice out because you can battle. I don't, I don't do this on TikTok live, but you can battle other creators I don't know if you've seen people battling on TikTok mm-hmm. live. Um, but basically, like, in the way that you and Sierra are sort of, like, pitted against each other now on two screens, um, your communities will then both be in and they will send you gifts. I don't really understand why people do it, but they do. They'll send gifts to make sure that that creator wins. So if someone sends, like, a TikTok universe, that's, like, £350, which is, what, like $600 in the space of, um, like, a minute. And an agency... They take, so TikTok pays the agency, if that makes sense. They don't take anything from you. And um, because of how well I was doing with the gifts, um, I had a message through from the guy that manages the agency and he said, um, we'd like to invite you down to TikTok headquarters just to do like a bit of networking um, sort of meet other creators that are doing particularly well on TikTok Live, which I thought was quite funny that they'd invited a, like a dominatrix down. <laughs> That's amazing. So did you, meet, did you end up meeting like other, like, other people the to- yeah it's way like, cool. it was like um it was interesting because there's people also there's a guy there that just plays guitar so he just live streams playing a guitar and people will sort of gift as he's sort of busking so not only is he getting sort of his busking income but he's also like live streaming his busking on tiktok live oh. um and like it's pretty much anything that you can do on there like there's a guy i'm gonna just get can i name drop as someone who's doing very well on tiktok live yeah. Yeah. There's a guy called Bevo and he's a British creator and he's got no back teeth. So he just basically sits on TikTok live eating like Yorkshire puddings and like different foods. And because he, <laughs> he eats in such a weird way, he will just send gifts. Damn, that's wild. And um, he's making about 25k a month now. That's I think. crazy. I've seen those people that even they will be like sitting and reading a book like not even looking up from it and just being like you know and people are sending them gifts and stuff and i'm like you really can't do anything on here sometimes when i see like the of streams where they're trying to just generate traffic 
to their OF on TikTok and they're sitting there and not talking, I'm like, we, it is worth putting in a little bit of effort on this live stream because you can use that as dual income. So don't just think of it as, oh, this is a traffic funnel. Think of it as, oh, this is also me at work. You know, like if you post a TikTok, so I always post a TikTok 10 minutes before I go live because then that increases the chance that that video will then go viral, which is then acting as passive traffic when I come off live. Mm. So it'll cause a spike in views, you see. So they'll go on my live and then if I posted a video 10 minutes ago and they'll look on it, it's more likely that they're going to engage, which then obviously sends the likelihood up that it's going to do do well. Aside from TikTok Live uh, or TikTok in general, what would you say is, is the next best thing that's working for you? Probably Reels on Instagram. Um, so I do one reel a day and I've also been doing one picture a day as well because pictures seem to be getting through like almost like a little spike on Instagram again. So I've noticed that they heavily get featured on the Explore page. So I tend to do one reel story uploads as well so people can see what I'm doing. Like reels, I think are always hit and miss. Like I've had a few that have done, done well, that it keeps sort of followers coming in on Instagram, which obviously then generates t- traffic through to OF as well but I think the main thing is for me when I when I had that call with that pro dom and she looked at my social media this was a couple of months ago she noticed that everything was a bit all over the place mm-hmm. so she said oh well you're a TikTok you're looking very sort of vanilla but then on live stream you're like this dominant tricks but then when you go to Instagram it's kind of just sort of like fitness so there's a disjoint which is not good from a marketing perspective so I've actually seen more success in just focusing on a few things since you've started, like, what are what are all the other platforms that you've tried, and what would you say is like the biggest waste of time, or at least for you, like, what what are the platforms that you tried, and you're like, this just fucking sucks. I think it's hard now to go viral on TikTok. I wouldn't say it's a complete waste of time because I know for a few creators are like, oh, don't bother with it, give up on it. But really, like, if you're repurposing, it's not it's not a waste of time because you're using the same content. Um, so I don't think there's any platform I would say for me has been a complete waste of time. Like I never used to use Twitter, but I use Twitter now. But again, that's because of my, it blends in quite well with my niche. Um, and I've also got, I don't know if you've heard of Wish Tender. I don't really know much about it. I've heard, I've heard mention of it, but that's about it. Yeah. So I've got a Wish Tender, which essentially acts as a wish list, but rather than them sending items to you, then they'll just buy something off the wish list and you get the cash through direct. So it's up to you and you whether you like want to get it or not. Yeah, I don't think there's anything really that has been a waste of time. It just depends on what your it really depends on what your niche is. Reddit, that's one that I think is pointless for me. I know some people are very oh, successful yeah. on Reddit, but for me, I just don't think it's the the forum. But that's just my personal view. I know you had um, a creator on here, and she'd done quite well for Reddit. Yeah, there's there's a few, but like we talked, we you know, even on our previous episodes, we've talked about it a few times, like. Reddit is is good. It's easy, but because it's easy, it's also extremely competitive. Every kind of entry level OnlyFans model or faceless creators, like Reddit, is the first thing that they go to, and it's just incredibly difficult to yeah. stand out um, on that platform. So, yeah, there's some creators that do decent with it, but overall, I definitely agree it's one of the. And I even have like I don't know if you remember however long ago that you first kind of subscribed to my telegram um i have a survey in there that asks creators you know where they get the most traffic and stuff um and reddit is is basically at the bo- <laughs> bottom yeah. of the <laughs> bottom of the list yeah. when it comes to only fans do you have any kind of like business plans outside of that or is like only fans kind of a, a means to an end towards something else or what what are your kind of your long-term goals I have got long-term goals, so I don't really know what my business plan would be, but um, I'm very interested in, in fitness, so the fitness aspect of things, which is also why I keep it so PG on my social media, so I'm trying to keep everything sort of quite chilled and not overtly um, OF. I'd say property, but I don't know, I haven't done enough reading on property yet to say, oh, that's a steadfast business plan. So I'd say that it is more of a means to an end, but I think I've taken more of a different since finding my niche, I think I see, as I say, a much more 
well-rounded perspective because there's some girls that are killing it on Twitter that don't even use like OF or Ella that are making like £1,000 a day just through Wish Tender, oh, yeah. which is insane. Like, so, you know, um, it's definitely a mean, more of a means to an end to me. I enjoy it. I enjoy this sort of creative process. I think what you're doing is exactly as you say. It's like a pretty well-rounded category that has very easy potential to bridge to other, you know, niches or more kind of, you know, mainstream niches in the future to, oh. you know, do the more kind of standard influencer thing with brand deals and just all these different ways that you could earn from that. So I think what you're doing is awesome, good long-term approach. You know, a lot of girls um, or just, you know, creators in general will make a lot of money in the short term, but it doesn't have that component that you have where it can transition to something bigger yeah. later. So I think that's awesome. Yeah, I love that. Um, I'll have all your socials linked down below if people want to check check your stuff out. What are, is Instagram kind of the best place to look at your stuff or what are your best platforms? Instagram is currently um, the best place. And obviously if you want to see me chit, chit chat in my pajamas um, in nylon socks, then TikTok Live is the best place. <laughs> Just depends. Oh, I'm looking for. I have to find it. <laughs> awesome. Um, yeah, so either or. So yeah, you can catch me on TikTok Live if you want. Cool. And then the last question I always finish, if you could go back in time and you were, if this was day one and you were just, you know, kind of getting started into this whole industry, what's the best piece of advice that you would give yourself? Be open-minded. So don't put yourself into a little box and be prepared for all of the twists and turns that you're going to end up going down because you might end up in a place where you didn't particularly envisage it just see where it takes you really and just try and literally just be be yourself because that's going to make your life easier 